Hi, I'm Dylan Adams. I'm a patent attorney and best-selling author, and today we're gonna to be looking at patent and IP clips from TV and movies and judging how realistic they are. First up is Iron Man 2. In this scene, Tony Stark is visiting Pepper Potts after one of his Iron Man suits was taken by the US government. It was an illegal seizure of trademark property. Wow, yeah, so the MCU is usually really good about details like this, but in this case, they are completely wrong about trademarks. Trademarks are not gonna protect the underlying technology of the Iron Man suit. Trademarks protect things like business names, slogans, business logos, and they actually may be able to get some limited protection for things like the Iron Man name or even the distinctive red and gold Iron Man coloring, but it's not gonna protect the underlying technology of the suit. So that's where patents would come in. Patents allow you to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering to sell the technology, which is what is gonna be applicable here. Trademarks are really not gonna be applicable. It's surprising that a really good CEO like Pepper Potts or the producers of this movie wouldn't know that difference. Ms. Potts? Relax. Mr. Stark is here. He refuses. I don't. That's fine. I'll just be a second. Listen, it's, it's our position that Bandy? Stark has and continues to maintain proprietary ownership of the Mark II platform. When Mr. Stark announced he was So the term proprietary is just a fancy way of saying that Stark Industries is asserting ownership over the Iron Man suit. And this could be related to intellectual property, which would be patents, trademarks, copyrights, or trade secrets. But it could also just be basic ownership rights in the sense of, hey, we built the suit and so we own it. Bert. Bert, Bert, listen to me. Don't tell me that we have the best patent lawyers in the country and then not let me pursue this. So now she switches to talking about patents, which is really what she should have been talking about from the very beginning. But when it comes to protecting something like the Iron Man suit, it would actually be really tricky. With a weapon systems like this, you don't want this to get in the hands of terrorist organizations or adverse governments or individuals. And what a lot of people don't realize is that at least when an application issues as a patent, all the information of how the technology works, all those details, they become available to the public. And so you wouldn't want to patent anything that is sensitive information that you would you know, want to prevent getting in the hands of terrorists and governments and things like this. So realistically, with a product like this, it's going to have tens, if not hundreds of patentable individual inventions in it. And if Tony Stark were my client, which would be awesome, by the way, uh, my advice to him would be to patent the things that are actually gonna go into other Stark technology. They're gonna be kind of mass consumer products, um, things that, he, that aren't going to be sensitive. That would be fine to patent as long as he's okay with that stuff getting out into the public, and especially if it's going to be in, in products anyway. But for things that are really sensitive and that are only gonna be in the Iron Man system, Keep those as trade secrets because you don't want that information to fall into the wrong hands. Also, if Tony wanted to patent any of the technology related to the Iron Man suit, I hope he decided to do it a long time ago because patent rights actually start to be lost upon a first public disclosure or public use of the technology if you don't file a patent application first. So here, if he's flying around and using the Iron Man suit and doesn't file a patent application first, that's gonna forfeit patent rights in the vast majority of foreign jurisdictions. And the US, that's going to start a clock ticking that only gives him a year to file a patent application. Otherwise, he completely forfeits his US patent rights. I'll get this stuff out of here. Well then, tell the president to sign an order. I'm not quite sure what sort of order the president is gonna sign, but if anything, the president is gonna sign an order to actually commandeer the Iron Man suit, which, spoiler alert, is actually what happens and allows Don Cheadle's James Rhodey Rhodes to become the war machine with this Iron Man suit. And that's more likely to happen given the national security issues and the, you know, the sensitive military technology issues at play. One thing to note too is that even if Tony Stark did have a patent on this technology, the government still could totally commandeer the technology. The government gives you patent rights and also has the ability to take them away and commandeer things. That being said, it's rarely, if ever done, but in a case like this where it's really sensitive and there's national security involved, this might be one of those rare cases where the government might actually do that. Next up is Sonic the Hedgehog 2. In this clip, Sonic's dad is confronting him because he has found out that Sonic has been sneaking out at night and fighting crime. I think you know what I'm talking about. The lying, the sneaking out, the, the pretending to be Batman. Blue Justice, trademark pending. Whatever, you're being reckless. Ugh. 
Not this conversation again. Now this is a correct usage of the term trademark. Now it, my guess is it was actually probably edited from a line that originally was patent pending because we typically don't say trademark pending, at least not in the United States, because unlike patents where patent rights start to be lost upon a first public disclosure, public user offer for sale, if you don't file a patent application, for trademarks you actually get some common law rights when you start using the mark in commerce. And so even though you'll actually then eventually file a federal registration, you still have some rights. And so that's why the term trademark pending isn't typically used. But then again, you know, Tonic is saying it as a joke. And so it totally plays. So we'll give him a pass on this. I just got, I just got goosebumps. And Sonic could apply for a trademark and actually get trademark protection on the term blue justice. Blue! justice. But unlike the urban myths around trademarks where people think, hey, I can trademark something and then I can stop people from using that term anywhere and I can charge people money every time they say the word or, or use the mark in commerce or something, that's really not how trademarks work. Trademarks are intimately associated with specific goods and services and specifically the, the goods and services that the company is actually using the mark in relation to. So in this example, Sonic could apply for a trademark, but it would only be in relation to things that he's actually doing. And so it'd be say maybe you know, like security services or maybe he has merch related to the, the, the Sonic brand. And so it'd be things related to t-shirts and, and stuff like that. But for instance, you know, things like computers or alcoholic beverages or chips, you know, he, he's not going to be doing that sort of stuff. So he wouldn't be able to exclude others from having a trademark on Blue Justice related to goods and services that are outside of the scope of what he's actually doing. Hey! This look good. Up next is American Gangster. In this scene, Denzel Washington's character Frank Lucas is confronting a rival drug dealer who is improperly using the name of his product without consent. Why you gotta take something that's perfectly good and mess it up? See, brand name. Brand names mean something. Blue Magic. That's a brand name. Like Pepsi. That's a brand name. I stand behind it. I guarantee it. They know that even if they don't know me any more than they know the, the, the chairman of General Mills. This is 100% correct. So this is exactly why trademark law exists. Trademarks are around so that consumers can differentiate between the source of goods and services. So that when consumers buy a product with a specific trademark on it, they can trust that it actually came from a given source. What the f are you talking about? What I'm Frank? talking about is when you chop my dope down to one, two, three, four, five percent, and then you call it blue magic. That is trademark infringement. You understand what I'm saying? Frank illustrates this perfectly with this example. So he's built a reputation selling high quality heroin with the brand name Blue Magic. And his customers have started to rely on heroin marketed with the name Blue Magic as being high quality such that they will maybe pay more for it or at the very least will buy it over the competition. So when Cuba Gooding Jr.'s rival drug dealer comes in and starts selling low quality heroin using the mark Blue Magic, this is unfairly taking advantage of the goodwill that Frank has created around the mark Blue Magic. And while, of course, you know, it's not gonna be trademark because it relates to illegal drugs which would make it trademark ineligible. Frank is totally right about this in principle. I do respect Frank. If I buy something, I own it. No, that ain't true. Again, he's exactly right about this. It doesn't matter that Cuba Gooding bought the Blue Magic heroin from Frank. The issue is that he's using the trademark without permission to sell an inferior product. Frank would probably be fine if Cuba Gooding bought the Blue Magic Heroin and then just resold it as Blue Magic Heroin, but he's not gonna be okay with it being modified to be an inferior product and then being sold under the Blue Magic trademark because that's going to erode and tarnish that brand. What do you want, Frank? You want me to change the name on it? I would have to insist that you change the name. Fine by me, Frank, I'll, uh, I'll call it Red Magic. There Even though that don't sound as good. I don't give a what you call it. Put a chokehold on the <laughs> mother and call it Blue Dog I mean, I don't care. This is actually how an issue like this could be resolved in real life, but I probably wouldn't be okay with the use of the term red magic because that would probably be too close and would be confusing, but I would be totally okay with the use of the term blue dog shit because that's probably actually more accurate as to the quality of the product. Just don't let me catch you doing this again. Catch me, infringement, insist. I don't like these words as much as please. Thank you. I'm sorry to bother you, Nikki. These are better words you use. You're coming to my motherfucking club without an invitation. You hear me? 
Yeah, people can get really upset when accused of patent or trademark infringement. I can't say I've ever seen anybody throw anything as a result, but I've definitely seen people blow up when accused of infringement, even when it's a valid case. People tend to take these things pretty seriously, even though it's a business-related kind of thing. Up next is Escape Plan 2, Hades. In this scene, Shu Ren, who is a professional prison escape artist working for Sylvester Stallone's character Ray Breslin, has been captured and put into a secret maximum security prison where his cousin Yuxing Ma is also being held, and the people running the prison are trying to extract some technology secrets from him. Your cousin is a brilliant man. He gave me the details of his patent, number 34ACJL, but not number three six b b b c k these are definitely not patent numbers of any kind that i'm aware of no country that i know of has patent numbers like this or even patent application or patent publication numbers it's probably just because it's a movie and they don't want liability by actually saying real patent numbers but yeah definitely not patent numbers i need you to convince him to give that to me why would i do that and now his love of money, his precious patent, is going to get you killed. This makes absolutely no sense. So patents are public documents, and at the very least, when a patent application issues as a patent, the whole file and the whole disclosure of the technology becomes public record. Maybe they're talking about a pending patent application that hasn't published yet, but even then, by default, patent applications are held in secret for 18 months and then they are published publicly. In the United States, you can file a non-publication request, which would delay this until the application issues as a patent, but even then, you, you can't file this non-publication request if you file outside the United States at all. What? You give up the first patent. So? They were torturing me. That one's nothing. He knew things about our background. Well, I didn't tell him. The second patent. What is it? Advanced Cube Satellite Tech. It's a game changer. It can override and control any computer system in the world, like a cyber skeleton key. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely the kind of technology that could be patented, and I help clients all the time patent computer technology related to this. It definitely is a bit outlandish as far as like what the technology is, but aside from that, yeah, it totally could be patentable stuff. It's not what you think. This isn't about money. I patented it so I could bury it. In the wrong hands, game over. Defense systems, nuclear codes, no one will be safe. This makes absolutely no sense. So again, at the very least, when an application issues as a patent, it's gonna be published online and become available to everybody. And one of the requirements when you file your patent application is you have to give all the details of how the technology is made and used. So if you're looking to bury technology, patents are the last thing that you would wanna do because all the details of how the technology works are gonna be available to the public. That's actually the purpose of the US patent system and it's actually mandated in the constitution to promote the useful arts and sciences. And the idea here is that you disclose all the details of your technology to the government and they'll give you a limited monopoly for a certain amount of time. And the benefit here is that all the technology becomes public and we can build on everything instead of just everybody working on things in secret. Also, he may not even be able to patent technology like this. So when applications are filed and when they're still secret, they are all screened and the government reserves the right to keep certain technology completely secret and not let the inventors disclose it when it's deemed that such a disclosure might be a national security threat. This is called a secrecy order and is typically applied to things like sensitive military technology that's trying to be patented. But regardless, Patents are the last thing that you would want to do if you're trying to bury technology. Either it becomes completely publicly available, everybody knows how to make the technology, or the government decides to keep it secret and will probably use it themselves. So patents are not a good option here. Kimbo, report. We're closer than ever to breaking your shame. Closer? We'll report back when you do. Focus more on getting that patent than your revenge. It's a risk bringing him here. 
Yeah, the premise of this movie makes absolutely no sense. So they've abducted these guys and they've been torturing them for months in this prison, trying to get information about these patents out of them. But that would be completely unnecessary given how patents actually work. So if they actually had the patent numbers like they said, they would just look them up online and have all the details. Or even if they didn't actually have the patent numbers, it would still be absurdly easy to do a patent search and find the issued patents that were published. Now, if what they were trying to really get a hold of were pending patent applications that were still being held in secret at the USPTO, it would still be relatively easy to get a hold of these documents without having to go to all the trouble of abducting and torturing and holding these guys in some sort of black site prison. So patent applications like this are gonna be filed at the USPTO by a patent attorney. And the better way to get these documents would just be to hack into the law firm's network and get the documents that way. Or worst case scenario, just abduct and threaten a patent attorney or someone at the law firm and make them obtain the documents. If it were me, that's how I would do it. They were torturing me. Up next is the core. In this scene, a team of engineers trying to save the world by drilling to the center of the earth are meeting with a scientist who holds the key to the drilling part of the mission. And it just so happens that this scientist had a complicated history with one of the team members. Dr. Brazelton, I see you know Dr. Zimsky. Yeah, 20 years ago, he stole my research. <laughs> After that, we, we kind of lost touch. Research that was equally mine. It's funny, I don't remember a check from any of the patents. <sighs> Yeah, animosity between co-inventors is unfortunately not uncommon. It's actually something that I deal with on a fairly regular basis. So by default, patent applications are owned by the inventors. And the way it works then is that the inventors will assign their rights to the company as part of an initial employment or founders agreement so that the technology is then actually owned by the company. Then if business agreements don't adequately define how inventors are gonna be compensated or otherwise recognized for their inventive contributions, and if these expectations aren't adequately communicated between the parties, then it's not uncommon that inventors are going to be upset if they don't feel like they've been adequately compensated or recognized, even if that's what they actually agreed to early on. Sometimes inventors have unrealistic expectations for compensation or recognition, and this is especially the case where inventions become really valuable or famous. The disconnect here is where early on, companies are just worried about getting the product made and getting the company going. And a lot of times early founders and employees are just gonna assign their rights to the company without really thinking much about it. Then in retrospect, when something becomes really famous or really valuable, the inventors wanna share in this upside, even though they actually gave away their patent rights for very little early on. The takeaway here is that inventors and co-founders should really pay attention to the contracts they're signing and make sure that they're actually comfortable with the terms of how they're giving over their patent rights. Oh, that went better than I expected. Next up is Jack Ryan. Ryan said the satellite from the South China Sea was launched by this company called Vogler. They've patented this imaging technology that allows you to locate mineral deposits underneath the earth. It's called flash LIDAR. You said it's valuable. How much are we talking? Trillions. What? Yeah, what is right. So flash LIDAR is actually a thing and has been used to hunt for mineral deposits, but a patent on it or the underlying technology is not gonna be worth trillions. Flash LiDAR works by lasers actually scanning the topology of the earth and it can actually get through uh, tree canopies and things like that, but it's not actually gonna penetrate the ground and identify things that are buried in the ground. It can be used to identify signatures in topology of the earth, which are gonna be indicative of places where you're gonna wanna hunt for mineral deposits. But again, it's not like a, some sort of Star Trek earth scan that is gonna be able to identify things that are buried in the ground. It's not that what he said was wrong necessarily, it's just that it could be interpreted to give flash LiDAR capabilities that it doesn't actually have. Also, while the mineral deposits that it can be identified by flash LiDAR and similar techniques could certainly be worth trillions, a patent or the underlying flash LiDAR technology is not gonna be worth that much. But I think what they're actually talking about is the, is the minerals themselves. So everything here is actually pretty accurate. What? Next up is the peripheral. In this scene, Flynn's co-workers are bringing her some mysterious tech that came for her in the mail. And what's it supposed to do? So it's some sort of remote piloting gizmo. You know, best guess that is. Yeah, half the components don't even have patents yet. 
as far as we can tell. It's like mercenary shit. My bad. Whether or not there are patent markings on a product can give you some sense and hints about the technology, but probably not as much as you would think. So it's best to mark a product as patented if you have a granted patent on it, or mark it as patent pending if you filed a patent application but haven't yet received the, the, the granted patent. And this can help with the damages in terms of patent infringement. For mass produced products, it's not uncommon to see a big laundry list of patents associated with that product. And this can give you a sense of the maturity of the product because it can take a long time to go from patent application to grant. Oftentimes it's gonna be several years. So that'll give you a sense of how long that technology has been around. Also, more established companies tend to be better about actually marking their products related to patents, and more sophisticated manufacturing technologies are going to allow for patent numbers to actually be printed on to the products themselves. Some companies may not even have patent markings on their products, even though they have patents on the product or pending applications that are relevant to the product. And in some cases, products may not even be covered by patents at all. They may just be covered by trade secrets or other sorts of intellectual property. It kind Kind of depends on the type of product, so it's going to be less likely for things that are physical hardware, where it's easier to break them apart and reverse engineer them, where trade secrets are going to be less applicable. But it really depends on what's novel, if anything, about the product. So overall, this is pretty realistic. Wait, seriously? If you enjoyed this breakdown of TV clips and movies about patents, you're going to like this video about patents as well. Also, please like the video so it can get seen by more people. Thanks.